again, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we have a, a great webinar lined up for you uh, in regards to healthcare in, uh, in a COVID-19 world. So uh, we'll get to that momentarily, but before we do, we're gonna go through a couple housekeeping things. And uh, if you're a sponsor and you're gonna be introducing yourself, please go ahead and raise your hand. There's a button at the bottom there and I will navigate to you in just a few seconds. Uh, my name is Lena Dobrier. I'm the Director of Operations at Opus Connect. We are a lower middle and middle market M&A focused organization. We are membership based. We have chapters in LA, Chicago, and New York, where typically we'd be doing monthly seminars in each of those uh, markets. But in addition to that, we do deal sourcing events uh, all around the country. Currently we're doing them virtually, but it's, uh, we're, doing, we're doing quite a few. So if you're interested in learning a little bit more about Opus Connect and how we can support your biz dev needs, uh, feel free to reach out to my colleague, Jacob Zephyrin. His contact information is down below. He'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, moving on here, if you are, so our panelists will be taking live Q&A as they see fit. Uh, and try to weave those questions into the discussion. So as things pop into your mind, please go ahead and use that Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions. Our moderator, Jerry, will field through those uh, as he can and we'll try to get to all of them. Um, moving on, these events, of course, would not be possible without the support of our sponsors. Uh, so we definitely wanna give each of them an opportunity to say a few words. We're gonna begin with Martis. And I believe, Vlad, are you in here? If someone from Martis uh, would like to introduce the firm, please go ahead and raise your hand again and I'll try to navigate back to you. But for now, we'll go ahead and move on. Uh, our next sponsor here is Focus Search. I do not believe Focus Search Partners is with us today, um, but they are quite a newer sponsor. They've been with us for a few months now. They're executive search supporting PE. So feel free to reach out to them if you have any questions or needs that they can help you out with. Uh, we'll move right along here. <clears throat> and I know Ryan, you are in here. I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you, sir. Uh, please go ahead and introduce yourself and your firm. Can you hear me? I'm sorry. Yes. Um, Hi, it's Ryan Udell. Uh, I'm a partner and chair of our corporate securities practice at White & Williams. Our firm is a Northeast physical footprint firm, although these days we're virtual, just like uh, everybody else. Uh, so you're, I'm broadcasting here from my house in the suburbs. Um, we uh, are our main office in Philadelphia, which is an epicenter of the quote, eds and meds. We have a lot of healthcare going on uh, in, in this region and we're uh, particularly pleased to support Opus Connect's endeavor here. Uh, we also have worked with Opus Connect in the past and look forward to, to working uh, with you folks in the future. Hopefully you have a great conference. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Um, and then last but certainly not least, Plant Moran. Uh, Jerry is actually our moderator today, so we're going to wait until we introduce <coughs> him to introduce the firm. But we want to thank you for your support as well and for leading the discussion today. Uh, before we actually get to that discussion, I, I keep alluding to, we have two poll questions that we'd like uh, the audience participation in today. If you could please uh, submit your answers, we'll go ahead and launch the first one. We want to know how you heard about today's event. We'll give it 20, 25 seconds or so, and then we'll move right along. Great, so it looks like a lot of you heard from us, which is awesome, we're doing our job. Our speakers, thank you for your support, sponsors of course, and LinkedIn, uh, appreciate your support there. We'll move on to the second question, and I think this is most helpful for our, our uh, panelists as well to understand who they're speaking to today. So please mark your answer, which best describes you. We do have a healthcare center deal connect following this discussion, so I would assume we'd have quite a few capital providers and investment bankers in the room. Uh, but go ahead and submit your answers and we will move right along. Great. 
uh, independent sponsor, investment banker, good mix, capital provider, some of our sponsors here. Um, thank you for that. Uh, gentlemen, take note. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's moderator, Jerry Lubers of Plant Moran. Jerry, go ahead and take it away, sir. Thank you, Lena. Uh, good morning, everyone. Jerry Lubers with, with Plant Moran. We're excited to, to be part of this Opus Connect virtual conference. Uh, I'm a principal in our transaction advisory practice. Plant Moran is one of the nation's largest accounting um, and consulting firms. We work primarily in the middle market. We're working with more than 1,500 private equity uh, and portfolio companies across multiple industries, uh, including uh, healthcare. In addition to our, our work in private equity, we also have a substantial healthcare practice within the firm, which we leverage uh, on our healthcare transactions. Uh, our footprint is Great Lakes region and Rocky Mountain region. However, we're working with clients nationwide. So we'll go wherever you need us to go, um, virtually or in person, hopefully someday soon. Um, our work in healthcare is really across the continuum. So working with uh, providers and health systems to uh, post-acute and ancillary services. Um, we've got a, an exciting uh, panel uh, and interesting topics to cover this morning. Uh, I'm joined by uh, Michael Lamb with Corporate Advisory Solutions, Rich Plan with Cantor Fitzgerald, Tom Goya of Com Comvest Partners and John Pasheen of Pasheen Cook Capital. And without further ado, I'm gonna have each of the panelists uh, introduce themselves. So Michael, I'll kick it over to you. Very good, thanks Jerry. And uh, thank you uh, to Opus Connect for, uh, for setting all this up. It's, uh, it's great to uh, have a, a focused event like this around healthcare. Um, as uh, Jerry mentioned, my name is Michael Lamb. I run a boutique merchant bank that has offices in Philadelphia and Washington, DC. One of our core coverage markets that we do, about 60% of our deal activity yearly falls into healthcare revenue cycle management. Uh, it's been a very uh, active market, uh, even in the pandemic. And uh, there's just been a lot of uh, new opportunities that are coming up as a result of the pandemic. So it's been a quite a busy, uh, busy period uh, for uh, our deal team, uh, despite all of the, the market changes. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Rich, you want to go ahead and... Thanks, Jerry. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Uh, Rich Bland, uh, Managing Director at Cantor Fitzgerald. Uh, Cantor Fitzgerald is um, one of the largest, if not the largest, privately owned investment bank on Wall Street. Uh, about 11,000 employees, 60 offices across 20 countries. And we have one of the largest uh, healthcare investment banking groups uh, covering the middle market. We do so holistically uh, with experts in a variety of different specialties. Um, I lead the multi-site healthcare physician practice management space, so spend my time with uh, provider groups across dental, dermatology, ophthalmology, orthopedics, um, so forth and so on. Uh, by way of background, I've been doing investment banking almost my entire career, uh, about 20 years of investment banking, uh, and have closed over uh, $70 billion in uh, transactions over that time. Uh, look forward to the panel today. and and the uh, discussions that follow. Thanks, Rich. Tom? Great, thank you. Glad to be here today. Uh, I'm Tom Goyla, partner with Convest Partners. Uh, Convest is an asset management firm that has a private equity as well as a private debt fund. Um, within that, our, our largest single vertical of focus uh, is healthcare. Uh, so we spend quite a bit of time in healthcare, um, investing in quite a, different area, quite a few different areas. Uh, about the only thing that we don't do is uh, biotech and high-tech medical devices. Uh, the binary outcome, we're, we're just simply not smart enough to do that, that type of investing. 
but we'll do control, non-control, uh, senior debt, really across the, uh, across the spectrum of, of capital uh, for healthcare providers. Um, Congress is comfortable doing has experience in, the, in a lot of different space. Um, classic middle market as well. You know, we'll, we'll do investments as small as 20 million up to uh, 200 million. Uh, and that's where we really spend, uh, spend most of our time. Thanks, Tom. And last but not least, John. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, so Pushin Cook, we're a private equity firm, been around for 20 years. Uh, about 70% of our investing is in healthcare services. Uh, two areas we like are anything relating to home care and physician practice. Uh, 30% is sort of niche B2B plays that, uh, that we, we find and like. Uh, you know, one of the things that differentiates us a little bit is all of us have operating experience in addition to all the transaction experience. So as a, as a lower middle market investor, these companies typically need that help in figuring out how to improve their model and, and, and make sure that all parts of the business are running on best practices. So we tend to get pretty actively involved and work with management teams in improving the business. Uh, prior to setting up Pushin Cook, I was in the private equity business with two other players for 12 years. So I've been around for a little while. Thanks, John. So our, our topic for, for today's discussion is COVID-19's impact on healthcare investing. And certainly as we, um, as we approached mid-March earlier this year, we certainly were, were, were thrown for a bit of a loop with, uh, with COVID-19. And, and, and certainly healthcare, uh, depending on where you were in healthcare, you, you, you felt a little different. Uh, certainly, the 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 hospital setting uh, was uh, in a complete flux with the amount of uh, cases that were coming in, plus trying to scramble uh, to to uh, support to support the uh, the care that was needed. And on the flip side, we had physician practices that were forced to shut down and and uh, for a period of time. Um, and, and those face-to-face -face encounters were, were um, came to a, a screeching halt. A lot has changed since uh, mid-March. Obviously, we're learning new things every day about COVID and 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 how we can be impacted. And, and certainly, we'll continue to be uh, to learn from this uh, in the months coming forward. So for our panel, as, as you guys think about the space that you guys focus in, uh, whether it's multi-site or ancillary services, um, let's spend a few minutes talking about uh, you know, recent trends and factors impacting the spaces that you guys focus in and, and overall deal flow for you. Um, and before we do, you know, I will say that We've certainly seen an uptick in, in activity, not only from a from a sell side, but also from a buy side perspective uh, in the Q of E space. So excited to see kind of an uptick in, in activity here over the last month or two. Um, Michael, I'm going to lead off with you if, if you want to share some thoughts on what you're seeing uh, over the last month or so, and and, and revenue cycle management and others in other spaces that you guys are focused. on. Uh, no, thank, thanks, Jerry. Um, in our in our area of the revenue cycle um, sector, it's been the first month or two of the pandemic was pretty challenging. We had several transactions that went on hold, and then we brought them back out, and we were able to uh, push ahead and get uh, a few of those deals closed. In our world, the biggest challenge is more around how regionalized healthcare has been and is. Um, in a lot of our deals, a lot of them are lower middle market transactions, you know, five, 10 million plus of EBITDA, and they're focused in particular regions of the country, some less and more impacted by COVID. And as a result of that, you know, that was a, a trend or an area that we had to really focus intently on to figure out how, how we were going to measure the effect of COVID on these businesses and what the sustainability from an EBITDA perspective 
uh, what was the business going to look like in 12 to 18 months down the line. And that was really the big challenge because many of the hospitals that were putting work out to RCM companies were delayed or stopped putting accounts with uh, RCM companies altogether. So we had some dy dynamics there regionally that were really causing uh, challenges for both private equity and strategics to bid and to understand the volatility in the marketplace. That was probably our biggest issue. But Jerry, as you're seeing, we're seeing an uptick again in deal activity going into uh, the back half of the year. So we're excited by that. Great, great. Thanks, Michael. Rich, uh, you want to share some thoughts on, on what your experience has been and what you're seeing? Sure. So um, it's amazing, you know, when you look at the calendar here and, you know, in, in just, you know, four or five months, I've now seen uh, several different waves of uh, transaction activity um, defined by very different dynamics in the marketplace. When COVID first hit, and uh, you know, practices were mandated to close. Uh, what we saw was um, a frenzy of, of activity at the single practice or small group level, whereby many of these um, practitioners who are also owners of their businesses lacked uh, either the resources, capabilities, uh, um, or access to capital to be able to fund their businesses through the closure and then ultimately through the reopening. So out of the gate, COVID saw a flurry of activity with small practices affiliating or selling directly to consolidators. Uh, what we've seen since the reopening is um, a bifurcation, I would say, in the market. So group practices, uh, large scale with resources and capabilities um, have actually been accelerating M&A um, you know, piggybacking on the theme that I just discussed with a lot of the smaller ones struggling to be able to um, operate and, and reopen. Now that that theme continues today, um, but it's also uh, added to it um, what we're seeing in the marketplace, which is, um, you know, many of the PPM businesses that had Looks like we've lost are now in, in financial in challenge. Sorry, I had a phone Sorry, call. Sorry, Rich, lost you there for a <laughs> um, second. Um, so obviously, you know, many of the PPM businesses had been um, heavily levered uh, prior to COVID, just given you know the strength in cash flows uh, historically. And when when your offices are mandated to close for for two months. Um, you obviously have uh, a stress on the system, on the balance sheet, and <clears throat> many of those businesses that were perhaps struggling prior to COVID, um, you know, given the dynamics in the marketplace, uh, you know, were, were pushed into a distress situation. So there is a fair amount of distress um, activity going on in the marketplace right now. And then lastly, what I would say is on a more positive uh, note, um, in the last two months or so, um, once there's been a build back of confidence on the patient visits, getting back to pre-COVID levels, um, we're now seeing a lot more activity with um, practices coming to market, looking for capital, looking for growth, looking for partners, more on the founder-owned side um, than perhaps on the private equity-backed side. But I think that once we get a couple of more months of performance at, at sustained levels, and the lending markets uh, can validate um, you know, that, that level of performance. We'll start to see private equity back deals uh, come back into the market. And you know, there's a tremendous amount of them that are sitting on the sidelines right now. So the anticipation of a tidal wave of activity is mounting. Thanks, Rich. Tom, you have some thoughts on yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's been an interesting, uh, you know, interesting few months for sure. Um, we've been fortunate. We've done um, seven or eight kind of new deals or upsizes with our existing uh, portfolio, um, and also new new investments as well. Um, you know, most of those have been for for businesses that have you know performing fairly well or had some sort of a, a mild hiccup along the way. You know, I think um, there, there's been. For a while in March and April, the markets were effectively frozen from a, um, 
from a debt provider, from a capital perspective at all, as everyone's trying to understand what's happening and, and what's going to happen. You know, I think now we've, we've really come a long way and, um, you know, the, the, the markets seem to be functioning fairly uh, efficiently on the, on the middle market side. Um, so I think that's good news. So from, from where we are now, where there's, there's definitely access to capital and businesses that are performing well, uh, ha have access to that capital. That's on sort of one end of the spectrum. Well-performing companies, good to go. That, that, that's you know, intuitive, obviously. On the other side of the spectrum is really distressed companies and those that haven't maybe come back um, for whatever reason. And, and it seems to be uh, in healthcare, and overall, I think a lot of things have come back. I think there's isolated pockets, you know, depending on what geography you're in. Um, there's been certain areas that aren't coming back quite as well. Um, and in that, in those opportunities, we're seeing some distress um, where, you know, broken balance sheets, broken capital structures, uh, and, and needing to be restructured. Um, it seems like people are willing to do things out of court, um, a little bit more consensual, um, which makes a little bit of sense kind of given the environment. Um, but those are kind of the two areas that we're seeing the most activity. We haven't quite seen it, uh, although I think they're sort of converging towards that middle layer um, where it'll be a little bit more regular way. Um, you know, maybe companies that had somewhat of a hiccup with COVID, but you can see coming back. Um, so I think it, you know, by the end of um, the end of the year and in the next few months, I think that we'll, we'll see some more sort of regular way transactions as well. Go ahead, John. Sorry, I was on mute. No, no trouble. Uh, so we uh, experience probably two extremes in our portfolio. Uh, we have a dental services platform, uh, which is Georgia, Tennessee, and South Carolina, which was forced to shut down largely. Uh, February run rate for the business was about 70 million. April run rate uh, for the business was less than 10 million. And July run rate was 70 million. So uh, bounce back uh, all of the safety, you know, precautions that need to be instituted for COVID-19. Uh, when we did reopen, we had to have all that in place. So uh, a tumultuous time for that business. Uh, it's very supportive lender, very supportive equity partners, work very hard through that. Uh, obviously, the transactions that we had teed up at the time as add-ons were stopped. Uh, and then now have restarted. Uh, and not only are we restarted with the small add-ons, the local add-ons, but we're seeing significant opportunities uh, that are larger acquisition opportunities or partnering opportunities uh, for that business as well. So um, certainly back to where we were and uh, I think piggybacking on what Rich said, there's a pent up, you know, sort of, a supply of transactions that we clearly sense, uh, and there is capital available. Uh, our, our lender continues to support us for further acquisitions, small and large, and our equity partners as well. So, um, you know, a sort of a tumultuous three or four months, uh, followed by a time of great opportunity, we feel. Um, and the other business was a home care business. Um, it's a uh, you know, franchise operation in 30 states, uh, 100 franchisees, probably a 10, 15% dip initially in February, March in volumes, uh, but by June back uh, and now back above where it was in February. So that really was almost not affected by, uh, by all of the uh, COVID issues. And, um, and there, I think, you know, what's nice is we're now back to selling new franchises. Uh, and so that's sort of a, a back to the normal um, is, is exciting. So, uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's been a very, very interesting time. Uh, and then on new transactions, we've, we've participated in, in, in a bunch of processes. We have, we're in the second round in three different opportunities. Uh, and so we're seeing good deal flow. Uh, most of those businesses are not necessarily, um, you know, directly COVID related or weren't impacted by COVID, uh, but still in the healthcare sector. Uh, and, and it's interesting how you can combine that. But <laughs> We've seen two of them. Uh, and, uh, and I think deal flow is only getting sort of more and more robust. Uh, lenders probably charging uh, 200, 300 basis points more, probably taking half a turn or a turn off on leverage. Uh, 
um, but the equity sources are also there uh, and willing to support transactions that make sense. So I, I think we are getting back to where we were. Thanks, John. And I think it's a, this is a great segue into our next topic around kind of the new normal as we're meeting with management teams and talking through, uh, you know, how COVID has impacted their business. Uh, certainly, each management team has, has, has considered and, and started to implement uh, new ways to do business. And so, I guess, um, John, and I think I'll lead off with you, like, how, are, how have things changed with, with your portfolio companies when it comes to uh, kind of this new normal and how operationally, how they're, how they're operating? Yeah, so trying to, for the uh, small add-ons, as you look at those and trying to get normalized numbers is a bit tricky right now. Uh, and so how you deal with valuation and how you get that financed is, is obviously a bit of work. Uh, but as they get back to where they were before, it gets easier and easier to go back to the deal that you wanted to do previously. Uh, and we'll do that as much as we can and get those, uh, those transactions done uh, as quickly as possible. Um, on, on new platforms, I think this is a very interesting time because um, with all the limited travel, um, you know, most of the meetings are obviously Zoom meetings. Um, tours where possible are being done virtually. Um, and, and I know some investment bankers would like to get transactions done uh, without a buyer and a seller ever shaking hands. Um, now, I'll tell you that that won't happen with us, um, at least not on a platform, certainly for the add-ons, we can do that. Uh, but, uh, but the fact that most of this is all getting done remotely, I think two years ago, we would have never imagined that we'd be here today, the way things are, are, are being done. Michael uh, or Rich, yeah. John presents a, an interesting point. You know, there hasn't been any travel. How are your clients um, viewing this as it relates to trying to, 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 to get a transaction done? Um, kind of where are, they, where are their heads? Yeah, Jerry, there's no easy answer and way to solve this, right? But what we're trying to do in all of our processes is go in eyes wide open and explain what may have, to, may have to happen. We've actually closed a couple of deals recently uh, without the buyer and seller meeting. Um, and it's not going to be for everyone. Some folks, John, like on your end, are going to not be willing to consider doing a platform deal without meeting. And it just, it is what it is. And there's others that are gonna have more flexibility we've got to work with what we've got on the investment banking side and try to figure out virtually how best to meet the needs of the buyers as well as our client to get comfort the other way that there is a reason to pursue a deal. Um, we're doing everything virtually and it's, uh, and, you know, site visits virtually are challenging, but we're working through those dynamics via video. Um, it's not ideal, but hopefully, and if there is a vaccine ever, uh, that people will start getting back into the route of traveling and, and visiting again. But I, I think there's a lot of benefits, though, on the virtual side. I can't, the, the efficiency gained and the time from traveling or avoiding the travel is also uh, not a bad thing for our, us investment bankers out there that, and, and private equity folks that live on the road going city to city, company to company doing the visitation. So there's some benefit there too. <laughs> yeah, I would just add to that, um, you know, obviously using technology um, to, to, the, to the fullest extent, people adopting Zoom and other mechanisms so that they can be, be efficient remotely. Um, what we're seeing is that uh, there are folks um, you know, who are willing to, uh, you know, commit to travel, commit to that in-person meeting, many of whom have said, hey, you know, we can't, um, you know, fund a new platform investment without meeting the management team, you know, face to face. Um, but yet, you know, they've got to save that travel to kind of close to the end 
um, you know, as, a, as one of the finalists. So going through, you know, a traditional first round, second round, uh, you know, management presentations um, uh, remotely, uh, some preliminary diligence, uh, site tours remotely, and then uh, maybe one or two groups being invited to the back end uh, to, to meet with the management team prior to final bids is, is what I think, you know, is probably more um, normal in today's uh, environment if there is such a thing. Um, you know, the, the, other, the other thing that I'm hearing and, 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 and seeing with folks is that um, especially given, you know, PPM, uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, how many folks have been tracking um, different specialties for an extended period of time, they've had the opportunity to meet with some of the management team over the years. Um, you know, so, so there have been instances, um, you know, big, big vet um, transaction was closed a couple of weeks ago, uh, and they didn't meet <clears throat> with the leadership team um, at any time during COVID, but uh, we're leveraging um, uh, prior meetings in prior years uh, and, and understanding the personalities and, and the fit. And so they were able to, um, uh, you know, close on an expedited process where they did it all electronically and remotely. Thanks, Rich. I guess, Tom, from a, from a lending perspective, like, how do you guys view this? What are you seeing when it, when it comes to, you know, the lack of face-to-face -face meetings and your confidence around that? Sure. Um, well, you know, it's one of these life lessons, I would say, I would generally say we would never, you know, make a loan without meeting with someone, but, you know, never is a long time as we're learning here in this, uh, in this COVID environment. Um, and, and we actually, we have done it. So we, we, we one of the loans that we made was to a portfolio company of a private equity firm that we knew well. Um, it was in the software area, so we didn't feel that we needed to make a site visit. So we were able to, to do a diligence and, and, and meet with management solely over Zoom. Um, so that was, you know, kind of chalked it up to an, a new one for me. Um, and then uh, on another example, um, we've got a, a business that we had a couple of my colleagues, Dan Lee and Joe Higginbotham, traveled, um, you know, across the country to the Midwest to, uh, to, to meet in person and said, you know, all right, how do we do this? Um, you know, again, start off with the, the Zoom meetings and then how do we have that site visit and that, that in-person uh, meeting. Um, so we've, we've kind of done it both ways and, 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 you know, tried to adapt. And, you know, I think the other thing is, is from a diligence perspective, QOE providers, you know, who, who, can, who has offices in different regions that, uh, you know, potentially somebody can, can drive to. Um, we've had one on the West Coast where, you know, we had a, a, a QV provider that was able to have you know, their West Coast office drive down to, to, to be there in person to do that. So um, I think um, everyone's adapting. Uh, and it seems to me that um, people have been fairly flexible. You know, I know from the investment banking side, sometimes you're trying to, you know, move things along, you know, minimize things as much as possible. Just think that's tougher in this environment. Um, but I think for, from what we've seen in the deals that we've closed, you know, people have generally adapted fairly well. Lena, I think this might be a good time to, to maybe pose our, our polling question for the audience. Um, sure, right. we'll pull that up. Yeah, yeah. So if everyone could please submit their answers, we're curious, will you close a transaction without ever meeting in person? Perhaps you already have. So we'll give it another five or 10 seconds. Don't be shy, only half of you have submitted. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and share those results. Okay, so it looks like more than half, yes, 55%. The other 45, no. I'll let you guys uh, deliberate that. <laughs> you know, Jerry, one, one of the things that we're doing um, what is when we're running in our recent deals that we've taken out to market, being at least in healthcare, it's a regional, as I mentioned, it's, we're really focused on, like, let's say the company, wherever the company's located, we'll draw a concentric circle around that particular region and identify private equity and strategic groups that are closer to home in hopes that there would be a visit or a site, uh, a meeting take, could, that could take place versus somebody having to hop on, the, on an airplane to go see them for the first time. And that's something that we're, we're seeing some success with as we're running these limited auction processes. 
Thanks, Michael. What about uh, the others here on the panel? Do you guys, as it relates to to, to travel or, or face to face, um, have you ch is it impacted the way you uh, target uh, potential platforms or add-ons? Um, have you kind of reduced the the, the geographic footprint or or kind of continued with this with the same strategy uh, John sure yeah no it hasn't changed us in terms of our criteria at all I think um, you know again for add-ons if they're local no problem we don't need to, to visit necessarily but for a platform um, at some point along the way you know, it's not just the CEO, but the team. How strong is the team? What's the culture of the team? How are decisions made? Is it, you know, one person makes all the decisions? Are they collegial decisions? Um, you know, that's just, those are all so important in lower middle market companies and getting your arms fully around that. So, so that when the transaction closes, you know what, what needs to be addressed and what doesn't need to be addressed. Um, that you, it's just for us very hard to get that through Zoom calls. Yeah, we certainly, from a from a platform perspective, those deals for us went on hold, um, and for the most part, have have been much slower in restarting. Um, Add-ons, however, we continue to to remain pretty active with add-on uh, Q of E's uh, through, through COVID. Um, uh, certainly depending on the, the, the sector within healthcare, um, that had an impact on some of those add-ons, but for the most part, um, those continued to, to char charge through. Rich? Uh, yeah, I would, I, would echo, I would echo that. Um, almost completely across the PPM landscape. So in, in, in um, you know, regular way discussions, whether it's dental or derm or GI or Euro, it's been consistent uh, feedback from, you know, the executives that I, that I talk to on a regular basis that for them, you know, when they're BD teams, their M&A teams, it's business as usual. They're getting on planes, they're getting in cars, they're traveling, they're meeting people. Um, you know, may, maybe it's, it's, you know, a little bit halted um, in the first couple of months, but certainly, you know, upon reopening um, and, and definitely in the last two months here in, in July and August, um, you know, they are, they are back to, um, you know, spending 80% of their time, if not more on the road, traveling to meet with, um, you know, you know current uh, affiliations or uh, prospects. Um, that's the nature of their business and they're, and they're continuing to push forward. Thanks, Rich. We've got some, some questions coming in from the audience. I'm going to, I'm going to take one of them here. Um, and, and this one is, is probably near and dear to everyone's heart um, from an anonymous attendee. Have multiples? How have multiples changed in the health healthcare service sector during COVID? Michael, you're smiling. I'm gonna let you take that one. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, it's a it's a it's a good question. We're not actually seeing multiples come down, in at least in RCM. Uh, we're seeing what they multiply on. Uh, be a factor is the biggest factor we're dealing with. Uh, and Jerry, this falls into your world on the Q of E side, that COVID impact and that COVID normalization process is not uh, an easy, quick formula. There's a lot that's going into that to really determine what the effect has been um, depending on the service line. So we're spending more time, the multiples in our world haven't really changed. It's more about the what, how the deal is being priced, and then ultimately structured. Uh, we're seeing a lot more structure in transactions as a result of uh, of COVID. That's certainly 
uh, Michael on the on the EBITDA kind of adjusted EBITDA side, an area we're looking at very closely and and trying to normalize EBITDA uh, for kind of this COVID period is a challenge and. And as we look at businesses really through July at this point, we're really focused on, you know, how, how far have they gone? Like, have they come back 80, 90%? And what does the, the next three to four months look like? Um, you know, is it sustainable? So um, certainly that's uh, an area of focus for sure. Rich? You, yeah, no, that, that you, you, you bring up a great point. I think that's what folks are really focused on right now is the sustainability of the recovery. Um, so if you're talking to large groups, um, you know, across the, the spectrum in my world and PPM, you know, the, the group practices with size and scale, they've come back quite, quite quickly and, and frankly, surprisingly quickly. Um, and whether you're talking about um, orthopedics or ophthalmology, um, you know, I think most of the groups now are back between 85 and 100%, um, you know, with dental probably snapping back the quickest, which is the most surprising. But, um, you know, what, what I'd say from a valuation perspective is, um, you know, the, the tuck-ins, the, the smaller deals, uh, they've, they've come down. Um, the expectations from the sellers uh, have obviously had to adjust quite dramatically um, in, in the world of COVID. Uh, and, and to Michael's point, um, these deals now have a lot more structure in them than they did before. Um, so maybe they can hold a, a six times multiple for a small tuck in, but you know, instead of getting you know, five turns at close in cash and, and one turn in equity, now it's looking very different. It might be you know, half or, or three turns at, you know, in cash at close with you know, one turn of equity and two turns of contingent payment. Um, you know, which, which is what we're seeing in the PPM world um, and echoes what I said uh, earlier, which is, you know, the, the vast majority of deal flow right now is um, with, with founder-based businesses that can take structure and contingencies um, and be, you know, you know, be, you know have, continue to have material skin in the game versus a quote unquote, um, you know, c complete sale of all of the equity ownership, which is what a traditional way private equity would do. Thanks, Rich. John or Tom, anything to, to add? Yeah, I think uh, for the platforms, we've seen valuations bounce back uh, to where they were. Uh, so not really down, not really up. Financing probably cut back a little bit. Uh, so a little more equity required. Um, and then, yeah, for the smaller transactions, I think those that are hurting, obviously the valuations are going down. So. I'll echo what, what Rich mentioned. No, not much to add. The only thing that I would, would add is, is that the, what we're seeing get done are higher quality things. So the, 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 the teams tend to be um, you know, top decile performers in their areas. Um, so I think there's been no, no degradation at all. I think the little, less quality stuff I haven't seen quite as much of, again, other than distressed. Um, so we'll see if, if, you know, how that holds up kind of over the next, through the end of the year and through the next six months or so. Tom, you know, as we you know think about stimulus money and PPP loans, how is that playing into to uh, companies that you guys are evaluating for for lending and sure overall? Yeah, no, it, it, it's a factor. Um, I think there's a couple different things. So PPP um, is are right, is it going to be forgivable or not? Uh, and, and you know, what's the test? How's that look? Uh, does it need to be considered debt on the balance sheet? Um, you know, if it's going through an M&A process, um, how much is going to be forgivable? What's the documentation? So it's another layer of diligence um, is one of the things that we've seen in a couple of uh, M&A processes where a PPP loan was sort of uh, outstanding. Um, and then, you know, Medicare has, has done um, advance um, pull forward of, of, uh, of Medicare payments where you've got to pay that off and there's an offset. How was that treated? Um, there's been Medicare grants um, that have basically been you know free and clear money how was that treated is it revenue is it EBITDA um, so there's a, there's a lot of um, you know a, a lot of potential adjustments and, and everyone needs to understand and I don't think there's a uniform answer uh, I, on the PPP I think that's that's pretty it's much more simple 
Um, on the Medicare stuff, I don't think it's quite as simple as an answer um, of, you know, there's one uniform answer to it. Um, I think, you know, from our perspective, we're taking on a case by case basis. In many cases, we're, you know, allowing it to have some sort of uh, credit for EBITDA or credit for uh, revenue. Um, and I think it just, it, it depends on how, uh, what area of the country the, the, the provider is in and how severely they were impacted and in what the, um, how much they've come back. So it's really kind of, um, you know, all over the map in terms of how you treat that. But there's, that's definitely a factor uh, in, in many of these, uh, most of the transactions that we've seen, there's, you know, some sort of adjustment around the one time or, or specific COVID related, uh, you know, EBITDA add back. When it, I guess, before we leave this topic, Michael, John, Rich, do you guys have anything that you want to you want to add as it relates to stimulus or PPP, maybe even how it may impact working capital? Yeah, I'll say on, on uh, maybe not on the working capital side, but, you know, I think in m more of a, um, a generalization is, and, 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 you know, this is more about COVID, but it, it feeds into the PPP and, and the PPE and other programs. Um, the, the, the small practitioners have had to deal with a lot. Um, you know, their businesses got closed. They had to figure out how to deal with staff, with rent, with costs, with accessing government dollars, with paying those dollars back. Um, it's put a tremendous stress and strain of anxiety on a lot of these practitioner owners. And it is, it is accelerated um, the psychology around what it means to be part of a, a bigger institution that has size and scale, which is a major factor in driving, um, you know, more consolidation uh, that is happening today and to come uh, in the near and, and longer term. Thanks, Rich. Um, I'm going to do a quick time check. Looks like we got about 10 minutes left. Uh, we've got some questions from the audience. I think I want to pose another one. And then you know, we want to wrap up with um, you know, what our panelists uh, kind of see, uh, you know, crystal ball type thoughts for the next three to six months um, before we conclude our, our panel. Uh, but we got a question here from Ryan Dell uh, about telehealth and where we're seeing telehealth, uh, you know, how we're addressing it from a valuation perspective and the types of practices telehealth is less practical um, or maybe such as dental or, or where we're seeing it uh, more frequently. John, you want to you want to take that one? Sure. I mean, I think telehealth we are we are using it in the dental uh, practices. Um, so I think yeah, te telehealth is probably the biggest change that COVID nineteen itself has brought on. Right. I mean, we probably accelerated five or ten years worth of what was naturally going to happen into three or six months. I mean, I remember as short as three years ago, states were fighting tooth and nail over telehealth, trying to protect their local docs from, you know, outside competition in other states. So that's all completely gone away. And the technology to get it working uh, was set up by so many companies in like a week or two. Uh, so it's been probably one of the, the biggest changes that is, is one of the outcomes of this COVID-19 uh, experience that we're all going through. Um, I think other other areas that that potentially you know we we think about um, there'll be a continuing of the consumerization of healthcare, um, you know consumers picking and choosing docs and and whatnot um, on their own and being able to shop for whatever operation they potentially need to do. I think uh, that's going to be something that that's going to occur not just in the next three to six months, but probably next year, two, three years. Um, and then also personalization of medicine. So looking at your DNA and what you're susceptible to and what you're not susceptible to and 
and getting healthcare that's custom made to you, uh, I think is one of the other trends on a go forward basis that is gonna, is gonna occur and increasingly be part of everything we're experiencing. Thanks, John. Uh, Tom, go ahead. Yeah, I agree with John completely. I, I think this is, uh, this telehealth has been pulled forward. I think it's a, a change that's here that's going to stay. Um, you know, I guess if you have a, a behavioral health company, you have a group session, why does the group have to be, you know, sort of in that room? You, you, could, you can do a group session the same way that we're doing this meeting right here. Um, so I, I think it's absolutely here to stay. I think providers need to figure out how to adapt to it. Uh, I do think it is setting up for a fight at some point. Uh, payers are going to come back and say, well, why am I paying you the same amount for a Zoom meeting versus an in-person meeting? Um, we're not there yet. That'll be in the future. Um, but I think from a technology perspective, it, it, it's, it's going to be part of the uh, part of practices in, in a non-COVID environment going forward. And ultimately, I think it's a good thing. Michael? Yeah, I, I agree with Tom. I think what we're going to see too is when it comes to just trends in the market, being that there's so much data around telehealth and the back end of it, I think you're going to see a lot of change around data security and HIPAA. Um, there, there's already been breaches. There's probably many that are ongoing due to all, kind of how everything's virtual right now. And as a result of that, I think the, there will be companies that are going to step in and there'll be many investment opportunities too around that data security side of the equation to deliver the, um, the telehealth model and make it make it very efficient and protected. I think there's going to be a lot of issues that come up in the short term on that. Rich? Thanks, Michael. Rich, anything to anything Yeah, to no, look, it's, it's been um, one of the few silver linings here of COVID um, in, in that, uh, you know, there's a, a, mash, a massive shift to to massive adoption level uh, that has taken place. And I think the net beneficiary, frankly, is going to be the patient because, um, you know, in many instances, uh, treatments go or issues go undiagnosed because of, um, you know, the, the inability to see a provider, uh, you know, in a, in a, in a uh, narrow time frame. Uh, if you have a virtual solution, you can do it without having to schedule three weeks out. Um, it's going to drive a, a material amount of, of adoption, um, and I think that the patients will be better off uh, because of it. Hopefully, we can figure out what the right balance is from a payer-provider perspective, uh, but that will work itself out over the, over the near and medium term. Thanks, Rich. We've got another uh, question from the audience. Um, this is a little little crystal ball action here with the election coming up uh, from Dean Miltimore, True North Capital Partners. How would you, uh, you know, addressing healthcare as it concerns to the outcome of the upcoming election? Uh, curious if, if, if you guys have any, have any thoughts here. I would say, I, I, and I've had several conversations around this dynamic, right? You've got, you've got two factors weighing. You've got um, you know, the COVID impact, which tells you maybe you should think about waiting uh, a couple more months to do a deal versus balancing that with you know, trying to get a deal done before a potential change in the administration. So not that I have an answer to it, but that, that topic has come out up several times. Um, and that's what people are thinking about in terms of, do I, go, do I go now and try to accelerate the timing to get this done before year end, um, knowing that I might, I'm either going to have to take a little bit of a haircut on value because of COVID or accept some type of um, contingent structuring in my, in, in my, um, in my proceeds, or, or do I wait and roll the dice and see what happens with uh, the upcoming election? Michael, John, you yeah, guys. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in Rich's camp. I, I, I think he, he nailed it. I mean, those are the questions that we're deliberating with our prospects and clients every day in terms of timing. Um, 
if there is any major tax changes, uh, my hope would be, depending if a Democrat comes in, how how quickly will those tax cha tax changes go into effect, and is there going to be a window of time in 2021 that gives them a little bit of a uh, a runway to do something? I just it, it's so hard to predict as to what's going to happen coming up with the election. Yeah, John. Yeah, I think uh, in January at the J.P. Morgan conference there was a lot of worry about Elizabeth Warren and what might happen in healthcare. forget about tax right and um, and so you know I think that's all gone away I don't hear anybody talking about about you know one administration or the other with any significant changes in where healthcare is going to go um, so for me it's sort of dropped as a subject for um, from a healthcare risk standpoint John, uh, you got anything to add on on this one? Yeah, no, I, I think John's John's right. I think you know there's there's the the natural ebb and flow uh, when you change an administration um, from one party to the next. So yeah, you've got a new administrator at CMS. You know what can they do? Um, you know th through the executive branch versus legislation. So I, I think those are things that we all are probably used to as healthcare investors, and you know management teams need to be able to adapt. Um, because those, those are things that happen. I don't think in this year, it's probably one of the more usual things, uh, usual components of the election uh, is, on the, is on the healthcare side. Well, uh, gentlemen, thanks again for your time this morning. I think we're coming up on the, the end of our uh, allotted time for this panel. Um, Lena, I'm going to turn it back over to you here in a second, but I uh, uh, want to thank the, the audience, want to thank Opus Connect, uh, and again, all of our panelists. This was an interesting conversation, and, and uh, you know, look forward to uh, the next two to three months. We're super op optimistic about, you know, where things are headed and uh, excited for, for the new challenges and, and future. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Jerry, for leading the way and to our panelists uh, for your contributions. I think this was an insightful uh, conversation surrounding something on the, on the top of all of our minds. So thank you again. Thank you to our sponsors, of course. And as always, if you are participating in our Deal Connect afternoon one-on-one -on -one meetings, please sign out of here now and sign into the separate link that my colleague Terrence Winters provided earlier. If you have any questions, you can reach out. We have a lot going on, a lot of content, a lot of deal sourcing events, so stay tuned. We will be in touch. Uh, and again, thank you gentlemen for today. We look forward to seeing you all soon. Stay well. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thanks everyone.